meeting of, of APEC New South Wales. Um, a big thank you to our in-person audience. Um, if you can attend, we strongly encourage you to do in-person so that we can continue having these meetings. There is pizza and a bar tag provided. So please attend if you can. So a few intro slides before I introduce Stuart. Um, that one. Uh, I may need to click on the slides themselves. I think it won't be. Oh, okay. There's the there. Okay. So the ASEG acknowledges the tra traditional owners of the land on which we gather today and the many lands on which we undertake our work. We recognize their continued connection to these lands, water, and culture, and pay in respects to the elders past and present. Um, so a big thank you to our members and our branch sponsors. If you're interested in sponsoring New South Wales, please let me know. Yes, Ben. <laughs> okay. We'll chat later. Um, so the housekeeper and um, Zoom ticket. If you have a question, click on the QA and then type your question in. Um, I'm pretty sure Stuart will go through this, but I think there's an interactive component to the online audience and in-person audience. And if you have questions, please do send us benefits on this to go. And um, another benefit is that you get subsidized for the dinner, which is coming up. Wonderful yes, the dinner which we're organizing. And, um, so he's on all the social medias. It's like um, Stuart Byron. Stuart is also an associate professor of engineering at USSW Sydney. His research interests are understanding the influence on deep physics, the development of sedimentary basins, and the use of machine learning in developing geological models. Stuart is researching geophysics at USW. And is a passionate advocate for tech based learning. Stuart has presented the results of his teaching methodology at a number of conferences and events, as well as working with groups and training students for colleagues in higher education. In 2019, Stuart was awarded the Best Choice Award for Excellence in Teaching in the Resident Star category. You can see a lot of Stuart's teaching in the link that was provided in. Um, the email about this meeting. And now we will introduce Joe. Thank you, Mr. All right. Let's get this. Oh, what screen is going to play? Yeah. All right. I can Thank 
Yeah, I think it's Hey, Stuart, I think uh, it's so distorted that we can't clearly hear what you're saying at all. Testing. Yeah, I think in between now, yeah, I think now it's better. Okay. Okay, let's uh, just switch it on again. One sec. Yeah. Okay, how is that? Yeah, now it's better. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, if it if it does play up, just make sure to. Right on the in chat. I thought I'd silence this thing. So sorry about the start there. <clears throat> okay. So, all right, let's get back into it. Sorry about that. Technology is only as good as it helps you to do the things you want to do. <clears throat> all right. So, um, yeah, so I guess this is in my way now. <laughs> All right, so I guess I came to this sort of question when I first interviewed for my position. I started thinking, I, I talked to some students uh, in the in, in around campus and just asked them, you know, about how they attend, did they attend lectures? And they kind of laughed and said, oh, no, we don't need to attend lectures. Everything's recorded. You know, we just watch it online. I remember when I started uni, they were kind of recording lectures back then on tapes and you could go to the library and get the tapes out and whatever. And so now that's become super flexible, super easy to get to get all that information. So the question is why attend uni at all? Why even come to Australia if you're traveling, if you're an overseas student to attend uni university? And so I thought, I did some thinking about this and I thought, well, we need to use the classrooms to engage students. We need them active and doing active learning. And I think it's particularly important with geophysics because it is, it can be a challenging topic uh, it integrates mathematics, physics, um, and a lot of geology. And so you've got all these different topics you need to be on top of. And so, and a lot of it is, it needs to be demonstrated. Um, so my idea was to, to kind of look at team-based learning as a way of overcoming uh, that to get students to collaborate together and to learn from each other as well as from me. So they have more resources in the class and also in an interactive way. So using interactive notebooks. <clears throat> Uh, so this is a sort of more like live lecture material. So rather than just having PDFs, which they just look at and read, they can actually interact, use the lecture notes to recreate and code and uh, do their own things with that. So they basically can, you know, we'll, we'll have a look at that in a minute. So I, in this talk, I'm going to sort of briefly touch on my, um, my philosophy, teaching philosophy. Um, uh, I will look at team-based learning as a kind of, as, as my pedagogy for engaging students um, and then look a little bit at interactive notebooks and how they're constructed. So um, yeah, for my teaching philosophy, my general idea is, you know, really, as I've said, to engage students, to get them to learn from experience, to see other people perform tasks and to give a lot of feedback in class. So there should be a lot of interactions uh, between me and the students and Teams helps with that because the, I can then interact with a team rather than an individual student. So if you've got a large class, you know, interacting with every little, every student in the class will be very complicated and take a lot of time, but you can interact with, if you've got a hundred students and you have 10 teams, well, you can interact with 10 teams within a couple of hour period, but you can't interact with a hundred students in that time. And we can also have students, as I said, learn from each other. So that means that they're kind of picking up, you know, tips and and tricks um, from the students who are actively learning the same thing at the same time. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm a member of the team-based learning co collaborative, um, which 
have been supporting this methodology for a number of years. Um, it's basically de derived from Mickelson's um, methodology uh, and uh, it's very carefully developed and has been carefully researched in terms of the different stages and how to implement it and the effects it has on students. I won't really touch in this lecture on, on how good it is, but it does uh, in both encourage long-term retention of material and it also improves um, the depth to which that material can be, you know, the depth to which students can attain material. So rather than just memorizing stuff, they're actually uh, engaging with materials I mentioned. There are several stages to the team-based learning approach. The first one is that the students should come prepared to class. So they should have done some work before coming to class. And usually I will record some lecture for them about half an hour and they watch this lecture before they come to the first lecture of the of the session. And because in that first lecture, they're going to do a readiness assurance test. So they're going to already start, you know, be interacting with the material in the first um, in the first lecture. Uh, so we in this preparation material, we can we can have, you know, a videos and a whole lot of things. I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec. Then we do this readiness assurance test, which is usually a multiple choice questions. There should be one clear answer and you'll have a go at that during the during the lecture. So hopefully we have a bit of fun doing that. Um, but you'll 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 do that in teams as well so you can just lean over a device here or online just use the chat functionality to decide on the right answer <clears throat> so these are the preparation kind of preparation material we have um, using uh, you know recorded lectures I mentioned collab pages uh, so these are these are interactive notebooks that I that I mentioned so we have you know you can plop things in here we have code blocks and we can have text blocks in there as well so it's a mixture of things and students can then copy this notebook and, and use it for themselves. They can edit things here. They can, you can give them partially completed notebooks for assignments and things like that. And then we do, uh, and we do of course, um, some uh, self-evaluation quizzes. So they can, they can do some practice quizzes before they come to the first class. So this is an example of uh, an interactive notebook, just to give you an idea of what this kind of preparation material might look like. So let's see if I can click that. So here we're looking at a uh, stacking of uh, different seismic uh, traces, and we've got to get the right parameters of the velocity and the uh, time offset in order to get the stack trace to work. You see, as I'm, as, as I'm adjusting that, the stacking is kind of working better and better. And so the students can actually play with these sliders in the interactive notebook and get a real feel for what is actually going on and how, they're, how the correction is the NMO correction, uh, the move out correction is being performed. All right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this, this is the typical um, TBL process as I mentioned, pre-work is kind of readiness assurance testing. We have discussion and feedback after that. So they first attempt this as an individual, this test, and then they do it as a team. And then um, that's kind of closed book. So they're not allowed to look at material or anything. And then we have a discussion about their doubts. So what, it, what that does means that my lecturing is spent clarifying doubts and looking at where they've failed in the material already. So rather than sort of spending a lot of time just teaching everything again, this is all done in the pre-work and then I focus in on the stuff that they're not understanding. So, um, and I can see that different teams will have different levels of understanding. You might have very successful individuals in, in one team, but the team always performs better than the best individual in the team. Uh, and then the big thing that we do, and I think it's very important for geophysics, is these team applications where you get your hands dirty with actual, you know, coding, doing um, or doing seismic interpretation or whatever it is for the for the class. Um, and then, yeah, we look at peer evaluation is also a very important component where we get the students to feedback on each other's work. Uh, so we have, I get a bunch of, oh, these team numbers are a bit screwed up, but we have six teams down here. We have 10 questions across the top here. And you can see that, well, question one, everyone is getting that correct. There's a bit of doubt with question two. Question three is mostly good. Question four is mostly good. Five is okay. And 10, sorry, we're up to 10 here. 10 is mostly wrong. So at the end, we've got a lot of, a lot of people struggling with 10. So I can focus my lecturing time in on this one and, and spend time clarifying their doubts. And you might see that a lot of people have had three teams answered B here first. So there might be a reason that they answered for answered B. They've, they might have read something in the material and not, you know, understood it the wrong way. So I can correct that. It also helps me to correct my teaching for the following year. So I can improve everything. And so this is the example of the question. 
and uh, and then I can get you know teams one or two. I can ask them; they've got the answer correct. I can ask them to explain how they got that answer correct, what they were thinking, where in the lecture notes they find that. And so already we have more team, in, you know, more interaction with students in the class. They're reporting to me what they understand in their own words. And because it's a team result, um, individuals who might feel a bit shy about reporting are much more confident reporting that the team got the right, you know, right or wrong answer. Or we discuss this, it, it defers a little bit from their individual performance. Whereas if I say, hey, Pagan, what did you get for that answer? I'm like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, I used to have a lecturer that would wander around my class and he had a ruler in his hand in mathematics and he would like just randomly, each, we had an individual desk and he would bang on your desk and go, tell me what the differentiation of this function is. So you sort of praying that he didn't bang on your desk that day. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that you don't really want it, you know, to stress out your students, you want them to be happy and they can go, well, even the teams that got the wrong answer, they can say, well, you know, we all thought it was B. It's not their individual, but you know, we discussed this, we did this in the in the team, and so it deflects a little bit from their individual performance. All right, so now we'll get you make sure everyone's sort of enrolled in this. Uh, so I think you can probably type that fairly quickly into your phone or whatever. We only need one one device per team. If you want to gather around in the team on the left hand side and the right hand side, and you can have a look at. Yeah, you're the left side and you're the right side. You're the right side, you three. All right, and everyone online can also jump in. Now you should see that there's one question, one quiz there. Um, uh, but it's not started. So I'm gonna, when everyone's ready, I'll just check the students or kind of you students are all online and logged in. Uh, there we go. Yeah, we can see the attendance here. Hi. Okay, so online. So anyone can join online, just jump in the online team. Uh, so I think I put that in the chat. I can put it in the chat again. So if you just click on that link, um, is that the right one? Yeah, sorry, that one. Uh, if you click on that link, then you can jump in and join uh, the team online. And then uh, you just, you, you just, that enables you to see the question. So you don't, if, even if you have no idea what's going on, you can still at least see what's going on with your team and see the chat. So uh, we had someone raise their hand. I don't know how that works. Okay. All right, so just jump in and... Uh, all right, so if you've jumped in, we'll get the, we'll get the quiz started. All right. Um, <laughs> Okay, so here we go. So we want to minimize this one. All right, so we'll start that now. And you got, I can extend the time here. They just give you five more minutes. Let's see how we go. Yeah, it could be. Uh, how how are you guys go with the? Did you were we able to? Yeah, we started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're you're incompetent. Okay, no idea. Oh, you just you can just randomly guess if you've got no idea. That's okay. You didn't take the course. I, I, I we can find out how real the geophysicists in this audience are actually geophysicists. How... Take an educated guess, it's not a big deal. If you get the first one wrong, you'll get another shot at it, so. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> well done, well done. Okay. Can I scan the QR code, please? Okay. Yes. So we're trying to put in A, right? Right. So have you put in anything before? Okay. No, just oh, uh, you have to take over his reporter. That's right. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. There we go. So if you're answering mine, one of you will need to do the reporter. Um, so you can just use the chat function to discuss which answer is correct uh, in in the Zoom call. Uh, just you know, randomly put anything you want there, and uh, so you know, and and then um, maybe David David Allen can uh, can be the one to be the reporter and just lock in the correct answer. How did you go? You finished? Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> okay, chat. Okay, so well, if you're if you're online, I didn't see any chat coming through, um, but just just lock in something. Um, I can only see one person who's jumped in the group apart from Hari, so that's okay. <clears throat> Let's see uh, who's finished here. Hmm? Uh, yeah, I think you have to finally get the right answer. You get you get X number of goes at it. So the oops, the online group can see we get. Very, some very active participants here trying to solve solve the question. So right. you know, that's it's kind of a good thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> not, not easy. Yeah. Nearly done, I think. This is the average performance of the of the total of everyone. And what's the right room performance? The the right room. Oh, no, the right. You'll find that out in a sec. We'll 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 announce the winner. Announce the winner in a sec. I think there's one more question for this team to answer, and then we're done. Yeah. Not the, um, presentation. Yeah, I, I've got this going, so they should see this at the moment. Uh, yeah, I'll put the PowerPoint back up in a sec. 
Oh, uh, because I'm sharing the wrong screen, maybe. Ah, I see. Okay, stop screen sharing. Let's share the right screen then. Screen. Okay. I think it's easier first. <laughs> okay, everyone is done. Great. I'll share the screen again. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so this one. All right, let's have a look at the teams and how they did. Okay, so. Okay, so we got we can have a look at the team analysis here. Um, so we can get a presentation made here. So we go through the <coughs> answer statistic here. Um, you can see that the left hand side of the room and online selected A first, and then the right hand side of the room chose C. And now we can choose the correct answer. So, you know, in, in, um, does it actually show the correct answer? C, yes. So the right hand side got that correct. Well done. Uh, so in, in, um, in an actual classroom, I would get, you know, I get you to talk about why you got your answers and things like that. And we would interact a little bit. Since you haven't learned this material, it's just a bit of fun. So, um, yeah, we can move on to the next one. So you know what's going on. So this is a question about the Fourier domain, and we're looking at two points uh, at one hertz and three hertz, and we want to convert this to the time amplitude domain. So we're just going to jump these uh, and immediately sort of show the answer. So D is the correct. So, so left hand side of the room got that right, and online, well done. <clears throat> and then finally, question three. So we're looking at the mean amplitude of white noise. Um, and here we've got, let's see, let's see what we got here. Everyone got C and zero amplitude is correct. Well done. So a bit of a mixed bag there, but um, see if we get the lead. Yes, everyone submitted. Okay, let's just show that. So, um, so that, that gives you an idea of what it is like from my teaching side. And I've got quite a bit of, you know, results here. I can say, okay, question one, there was the highest fail rate. So maybe I need to do a little bit more work on, on explaining that. And we can also look at all the team responses here and the order of answers that teams, you know, chose those. So, um, you know, so yeah, again, question one had the most uncertainty. Left hand side of the room had no idea what's going on here. So uh, <laughs> that's okay. May. <laughs> so yeah, not not bad. Um, so, okay, well, that's sort of, you know, that's basically that that. Um, but you get the idea of what it's like in the classroom for these kind of very simplified. Um, so am I sharing the correct screen now? Hari, am I sharing the correct screen now? Are you seeing the presenter view or the? Hey, Stuart. Uh, we are still seeing uh, seeing the presenter view. Hari, are yeah. you there? Online. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I think he's gone. To, this has gone to sleep. That's why. Okay, one sec, Hari. Sorry. Yep. Try again. Harry, can we hear you now? Yes, we can hear you. That's fine. Okay. Is that is that the right screen that I'm sharing? But the screen is fine. We can see the PowerPoint, but it's still in personal view over here. I think if you have two okay. screens and if you put it in the in the slideshow, one will be personal. There we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's now fine. everyone else All can good. see it. that's not going right. But anyway. Yeah. Doesn't All matter. Good. Um okay, so so most of the class time is spent in these sort of industry, these team-based team industry-like application exercises. Um, and so they, as you've just seen, you huddle around groups, but in that case, it's open book. You'll have people working on different aspects of it, bringing in information, reading stuff, some people coding, working together to kind of solve things. Um, and so, yeah, that, this is a very interactive experience. And as a next structure, I can walk around the classroom, see how they're going, listen in on their talk, suggest different routes that they might take or look at, different resources they might look at. They don't have to give just give the answers. So there's a lot more feedback that comes with this kind of teaching. 
So this is an example from one of my application exercises. And it's like, well, we're looking at, we're looking at a case of, um, this is in Colombia, I think, offshore. And you've got this kind of um, uh, alloctonous terrain here that's kind of um, slid up slid up here and, and a bunch of uh, normal faults, but then this sort of inversion. Um, and so, you know, looking at different, they have to sort of integrate information around the ages of the different struck, you know, different um, uh, parts of the, of the terrain here. So I, I can't really see from here, but you've got the yellow is the early Miocene and the green is the Cretaceous and so forth. So you got a little bit of a Cretaceous underneath here. And then they can look at, so like oil and gas migration pathways, or, you know, look at how the basin would have formed, where would, where would there be various elements that might be good for reservoirs and so forth. And so kind of integrating all this information and producing results. Um, yeah, so you get all these groups that are huddled around trying to solve that, discussing their ideas. Um, and it's a very kind of good experience. And we get, we get a lot of feedback. So one thing you can't really see here in the slide, but they give a lot of detail in their answer uh, for all of these questions. We ask them to give them reasoning and they say, oh, well, team A, I mean, there's not much feedback here. Don't, you know, it's just a, a single line or a team D is given a lot of text. Um, team A might have attached something, but but anyway, they can, team C and team D I've, I've selected as good answers. And so um, what we then do is we ask the students in their teams to vote on these two answers and which one they like the best and why. And then I ask the other teams to explain, so A and B, I ask them to explain what they learned from team C and D. So that, that progresses the knowledge rather than just hearing me talk about what the correct answer is, they're seeing other students perform well and looking at the ways they present their results and they're learning from that as well. So this is kind of, a, this is called a gallery walk or an e-gallery walk. Um, and it's a really good way of, you know, you know, really giving a lot of feedback and really, you know, chewing up that material. Um, yeah, and then, and then I use Microsoft Teams to kind of glue everything together. So there are different, um, it's a bit hard to see here, but there are different channels sitting on the left side here, which uh, store all the different weeks or modules. Uh, and then up the top, we have, we, each module has different links. So I can put my lecture notes in there and put the collab, the, the interactive notebooks. I can have little um, self-evaluation quizzes that they can repeat over and over again. And so this sort of hangs everything together. But also very importantly, there's chat functionality within here. So within each channel, I can create a team chat function, much like you had in the Zoom here, but it's, that it's their private channel for their team. So they can share files and share everything on there. And I can see what's going on as well. And they can tag me and ask me, oh, Stuart, we're really struggling with this. We think it might be, you know, this is our, the way we're approached it. And then I can jump in and give information. So during the, during the term, and I get a record of everything that's going on. And I really get to hear what's going on. And we also do breakout rooms using those channels. Uh, so to jump on to the next part is looking at um, the Colab sheets, the interactive notebooks. So there's a bunch of different interactive notebooks. Colab is from Google. It's, it's just one, one way of presenting this information. So this, this looks like lecture notes. There's a course summary here, a nice photo and stuff like that. So you can fill it with text. You can share these links to anybody. Um, they sit on the web. But these are also computing nodes. So behind here is, is, is a connection to a computing node. And that computing node provided by Google sort of will crunch some numbers for you and produce graphs or, or uh, figures for you live. And so we'll have a look at that in a sec as well. So one of the cool things we can do is we can hide code from um, the students. So we can just say, oh, you know, just please run this cell. And this, this is hidden all the input functions and everything that is, you know, it's a bit hard to see. This says import um, requests, import IO, import NumPy. Um, and then there's, and then it grabs some data from GitHub. And so it pulls data from the web and loads it into this module. And so all of this is hidden from the students. So you go, don't worry about that. That's all just press play there and you're done. And then you can go on, you've got your data loaded and we can go on and do look, look at the learning. So um, in this one, we, we're, Again, we'd have a look at that normal move out correction, which I had the interactive slider for. Now it's their turn to create the, you know, to code that. And so what I've done here is I've, I've, got, um, I've, I've got the data selected. I've put a bunch of definitions, like what are the offsets? What are the traces? Um, the two-way time function um, and the number of traces and so forth. 
and then we can print out like what are the offsets? Are oh, the offsets are 30, 90, 150, two, so these are where the sensors are in a 2D array. So we just we just got the distances in, in meters from the from the um, from the source. Uh, so they can all print that out. They can look at that, look at the data, um, and then and then they're they're asked to code the NMO correction for just one trace. But I also give them the plotting function so they can then have a look at how to plot this in a nice way. And so then they once they correct one of these traces, they can see it then plotting uh, in this horizontal. And so, so here they, they're dipping, the first reflection is dipping, but they can correct it up to here. And then they see that, oh, we've done it. We corrected it. That looks great. So, or it looks totally wrong and they can update their code, right? So we can go around and fix that. Um, again, this text is very small, but the idea here is I can also create um, uh, simulations. So I've got, um, this is an underworld simula simulation, which is um, Louis Marese's group in, Mel in, in ANU, uh, formerly in Melbourne, and Monash was um, responsible for producing this geophysics code for Mantle Convection. We can load that in, uh, and then I just tell them to run all. Um, they can then play with these parameters here. So this is the um, plume thickness, which is this parameter down here. They've got the slab thickness up the top. Um, they can look at the temperature uh, minimum maximum. So that's zero and that's two. So there's dimensionless temperature. So we can imagine that this might be, you know, several thousand degrees and this is, you know, surface temperature right at the top. Uh, and then we can run the simulation with different Rayleigh numbers. So I get them to just play with the Rayleigh number, which determines the vigor of convection versus diffusion. And they can look at the results. Okay, this is with a very low Rayleigh number. So all the temperature is just diffusing before anything can move. It already the heat has gone. And so we can focus on the physics of this and playing with the Rayleigh number rather than playing with the code. So for first year students, I hide all of the code for this altogether. And then they just play with the Rayleigh number, which is already advanced enough, complex enough, you know, idea, but they can play with that and then see the results. Okay, this is a high Rayleigh number. This is a low Rayleigh number. This means everything's convecting and moving and bubbling around. And this means it's just sitting still and gradually, you know, temp the temperatures you know, diffusing through the whole um, volume. And we can look at other concepts like this is the um, the, NR, uh, the RMS velocity, so the average velocity in the plot. And we can look at, okay, what is the consequence on the average velocity? Obviously with a low Rayleigh number, average velocities will drop and be quite low. And so you can look at those differences as well. And we can focus on all these kind of fairly advanced concepts through using code, but all the code is hidden from the students completely. Yeah, so, um, I've got like a 10-week course on geophysics and we look at, you know, seismic data and acquisition in 1D and 2D. We look at seismic waves and we do um, some interpretation of uh, 3D seismic. Um, and, uh, and, you know, these are the kind of the learning outcomes for that. And I basically sort of do a backwards design. So I think about how, you know, what, how do I want them to explain wave propagation, image processing? So that, that's kind of a very theoretical thing. So that's all the quizzes and, and, and quiz questions. Can they get those right? Can they explain a bit of the theory with a, a short answer in the application exercises? Uh, so I think about what kind of assessments, what kind of learning activities they can do to demonstrate these. Interpret, analyze geological features in seismic images. Well, we're using Doug Insight for that. Uh, and then we're using co computer algorithms and stuff like that for this one. So we're thinking about how we can do each of these uh, in terms of the learning outcomes and then basically feeding that backwards. So um, the, the course is broken into five modules. So I just sort of decide to group them in this way uh, to make things a little bit easier. And then each module is handled in teams as a chat. Um, and as I said, modules one, two, and four focus on code. We kind of set the code up for the students. Um, we have a Python tutorial to get them going. So this is involving zero prerequisite knowledge. We want them to come in with no Python at all, if, if need be. And then we just walk them through, you know, how to do the basic things. What is it? What does it mean? We have a times array here, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. That's the listening of the seismic, you know, sensor. It's just listening at a certain time. And then we have the, the trace. So these are the amplitudes that the, the sensor is receiving. And we can see that in data and then we can plot it and we can see what that looks like. So you get a very hands-on view, although it's rather simplistic, you get a hands-on view and then we move all the way to do migration using Python from this starting point. 
Um, and for modules three and five, we use Doug Insight. So we, they've got a bunch of beautiful tutorials online. And so we can present all this stuff and, and get them to actually interact with some 3D data. So that's part of the application exercise. Here's the data, download the data, and then do some basic things like import it into Doug Insight. You know, you've got to work out where on the earth is it located? What kind of you know, reference frame do I need, need to use? Um, you know, and so forth. So just getting the basic import. And then they do that in a team so they can get to a point where at the end they can go on as an individual and then do some more complex interpretation on their own. So the basic sort of building blocks are all done in the team. And then they build from that to go on to their individual uh, components. And this is, gives you an idea. I got this around the other way. Right? So before we implement a TBL, you basically have a lecture, a bit of a weekly quiz. You get some feedback on your answers in the quiz. You know, I, I, got, I got seven out of 10. Oh, didn't do so well that week. And then, you know, you basically go get to a final lecture where they do some quiz revision. And then you go to your, your exam. And that, that's basically the amount of feedback. You might get one question, you know, in the audience. Oh, what is the, which one of these is zero offset? You know, and I'll jump, jump on a student, right? So that, that's, that's the interaction you get. This is how I've mapped my feedback for the course. So basically, we're starting off here. We're doing learning activities. We've got a practice quiz. So they get self-assessment out of that. That's one type of feedback. Um, and then they go to do the individual um, readiness assurance quiz, the team one, they get process level feedback while they're doing the team quiz. I can give them ideas and hints as, you know, as to what they've thought about. They've got self-assessment and they get peer feedback in that process. Then we have a class discussion, they get task feedback. So what was right, what was wrong, but they also get peer feedback. They see the other students, what they got, and we discuss it. Um, the application exercise, of course, a lot of peer, peer feedback and a lot of process level feedback. So we're not so much focused on the task there, we're focused on the process of solving, solving the problem. And the gallery walk where we can do some self-assessment, you can see what other students wrote, you can realize what might be a better answer. And then we get down to um, some exemplars on, on take-home exams and things like that. So we have another assessment here. And finally to the summative exam. So you kind of do this loop where there's a lot of different types of assessment, but a lot of different types of feedback importantly, a lot of kind of discussion in the class. So this is the result of all that. So, you know, I was talking at the beginning about how to get students in class. And basically I'm achieving over 90% attendance in my classes because of this kind of interaction. Students enjoy it. They feel like they're learning, that coming to class is useful um, and so forth. I've done it also in an online format. The hardest format to do this is obviously blended when you have people online as we've just done and people in person because it's hard to split your attention. But if you've got some support in the classroom, you can do it. Uh, and so this was, this really, you know, this really helped me like enjoy teaching a lot. And then I've done some, um, you know, I did some improvements. I've been trying to get the TBL format correct. Um, so, you know, sort of reducing lecture instruction, increasing teamwork in class uh, over, the, over time and, and, you know, reducing the amount of individual quizzes they have and so forth. But anyway, the main result is that when I asked students which part of the learning activities they enjoyed the most, they reported team activities were the most enjoyable. So you can see this very strong preference for the team activities, individual activities, not so much. I even dropped out this individual activity here because I just felt it was so, it was so disliked by students. Um, and then I asked them, you know, how overall, how were they satisfied with the course? And this is the response I got. And then, um, and then this is with my teaching at the end of term as well. So um, generally very good feedback from the students. And obviously for me, the other good thing about it is I can constantly improve my teaching because I know basically where I'm missing. So this year I'm going through this intense revision period already in May, starting before I start teaching in June. So I can get everything ready based on all the feedback I got from last year and where things didn't quite match. So that's it. Thank you. Um, do you want to get the mic, a roving mic, which we will um, employ so everyone online can participate, hear the questions uh, here. And just switch it on. Yeah, just be patient. It'll come. Yep. So if anyone has a question, happy to take those. 
question is uh, when you're working in teams and they're doing uh, computer coding, do you find that one person takes over the coding or do they work as a team? <laughs> And what we did is basically made an individual assignment that would follow straight on from that teamwork. So even if there's a good coder in the in the in the team, the others have to learn from that coder. So they kind of will go sit around. Can you, can you explain that to me? No, I need to get this right for myself. So we make sure that the they're quite aware that this individual assignment will be based on this work. So it's basically a, a, a more advanced version of that team activity. So, and if they help each other in that team one, they're much more likely to get help from that good coder when they come to their individual assignment. They get stuck and they can go, oh, I got stuck in that. Can you help me get over that obstacle? So it feeds back into their own performance um, later on as well. So yeah, that was one thing we did struggle with though. Example focus on high quality data which has been acquired somewhere, but do the students actually learn to read an instrument such as a magnetometer, a gravity meter, a uh, basic seismic system in order to develop an appreciation of quality assurance? How do you know you're actually dealing with good data? That's a good error in the day. We add error into the data. Some of that is added synthetically. So we'll add, we, one of the things we do is we spend a module talking about processing of the seismic data. So we add in um, noise and some other signals and we ask them to split the signals up and remove the noise. So they have a module where they're processing that data. Um, as a sort of computational person, um, we don't actually, and we don't really have time to bring instruments into, the, into there and go into the field and do things like that. So we're doing everything from the, you know, arrival of the data onwards, but there is a lot in terms of just, you know, stacking the data. So that's that's pretty close to the instrumentation and then removing things like ghosts and and stacking, you know, all that sort of stuff. So um, we're doing a lot of that raw processing as well and signal processing, but yeah, there is there is that element of kind of like looking at the, and placing a sensor in the ground and, and seeing what the results are, which I think would be better for maybe a third or fourth year. <laughs> student yeah, to get to that point. Uh, you've shown a plot of uh, 9% uh, yeah. attendance. What was the attendance in January? Um, I don't have a record because I wasn't teaching the course. So I basically took over the course and then started, um, started it. Um, so Derek Palmer who's online was teaching this before me. So I, I guess we could ask him what the attendance was like. I think he ran it in a very kind of very focused on tutorial mode as well. And he was also very aware of this kind of pedagogy around, you know, getting people to work together. So I imagine that, I don't know if this is an improvement in this particular class, but I would say that it's definitely improvement on the standard around UNSW um, that I've seen. And the um, there's uh, many, many of my colleagues are very good at, at getting students in the class as well, but the average class is probably not that well attended. Um, my son's taking a bunch of classes and you know they kind of they they will just watch the recordings online and you know they, yeah I'll come in all week but then he's not there most of the days you know so um, I think there's still a tendency for students to avoid especially post COVID so bringing them bringing them into the classroom is really important um, and this tutorial approach is is very good for that yeah I should thank I should acknowledge Derek uh, as well because I, I based a lot of the course off his of his original work um, he gave me all the the slides and then I've developed uh, developed MATLAB and I developed and I uh, implemented Doug insight onto onto kind of the basics that he had um, and then I also should acknowledge Arthur um, Shapoval who's uh, who helped me develop a lot of the material in the collab sheets um, and um, the application exercises uh, as part of the upgrade to this course that we did uh, the digital upgrade Derek has oh yeah so do you want to read can Hari can you come on speaker and Read the question for us. Yep, sure. I don't think there is any question online. Oh, can we, can we, can we, can you make him a, can you give him audio or something? Can we enable him to speak? Uh, Zoom, here we go. I have to do this. Uh... 
Can, I don't know if you can. Go to participants. Yep. Oh, allowed to talk. Oh, this is very powerful. There we go. Derek, can you hear yeah. us? So I think you can unmute Derek now and, and we can we should be able to hear you. Okay, there we are. Okay. Ah, fantastic. Welcome. Okay, well, look, uh, Stuart, let me congratulate you on uh, both an excellent presentation and more importantly, on a, um, a major advancement in your, in your teaching technique. I should say that um, I taught for 10 years after I retired as a casual, and it was on a year by year basis. But towards the end, I knew I had to change my style from the traditional chalk and talk to something like you're doing. And I was relieved when you finally were appointed to the position. In my case, I had a different challenge. And the challenge I had was to get the, um, in my case, the petroleum engineers to come on board with seismic techniques uh, as, a, as a valid technique in reservoir management. Mm -hmm. And it was just at the beginning of the introduction of 3D. Mm. Excuse me. And I've got to say that it was a challenge for the first five or six years, but eventually, as the case histories built up, um, they, they became more... Uh, aware of the benefits of seismic technology. Now, um, so uh, those those challenges, those battles are yesterday. Um, the battles and the challenges you face are quite different. And I've got to say that um, I think you're doing a good job and, and carry on and, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, I mean, now the cohorts changed a little bit as well. So we're starting to get earth science students come through this course as well now, undergrads. So I, one of the things I got, I uh, was lucky enough to get this made part of the earth science major in the Bachelor of Science. So uh, so now uh, I think this year we have the first students who will be going through from the earth science cohort uh, as well as engineers. <clears throat> And I've, yeah, I've, I've sort of reduced the petroleum aspects of the course and I'm focusing more on imaging and using seismic for, for any kind of imaging of, of whatever. But we do have some great 3D seismic data sets that we use. So we've got the F3 data set from the Netherlands, um, which is a part of the course. And um, so the students can load that whole data set into Doug and, and have a look at all the beautiful salt <laughs> structures there and faults and things and play around with it. It's really good. If you want to uh, talk online, just raise your hand. And I've worked out how to allow you to talk now. All good, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thanks everyone online for joining. Um, we appreciate you jumping on as well.